Lover Brothers presents Lux Soap Theatre. Greetings from Hollywood, folks. I'm your host, Melvia Rick, filling in for Willie Keeley, who was filling in for Cesar Biedermann. Seems like there's a lot of turnaround here, but I suppose that's besides the point. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for tuning in once again, for where would we be without our esteemed listeners? Now, if anyone in our audience has not already read Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, then I envy you tonight's experience of listening to this exciting adventure story for the very first time. You'll make the acquaintance of one of the most famous characters in all of literature, the fascinating pirate Long John Silver, and meet young Jim Hawkins, who lives an adventure all kids dream about. And now, the curtain rises on Treasure Island. I'm leaving for London in the morning. They have convinced me, the squire and Dr. Livesey, that my education is in sad need of repair, that it is time I become a gentleman. I'm not reluctant to go, but there is already so much that I've learned, and the thought that I may forget the past, the high adventure of my boyhood, has urged me in the writing of this journal. On the one hand, it was a needless labor, for how shall I ever forget Long John Silver and the voyage of the Hispaniola? On the other hand, time has a way of clouding the past, and it's a comfort to know that this whole story will always be here between the covers of this journal. The year was 1765, and then, as now, the Admiral of Inn belonged to my mother. The winds still blow, the seas still crash, just as they did that late afternoon when the door opened and I saw a stranger on the threshold. Rum boy, glass of double rum. Yes, sir. Rum, sir. Well, this here is a quiet cove for certain. Much company, mate? No, sir. Not much, sir. Ah, oh, who be the owner here? My, my mother, sir. She, she's gone into town, sir. Oh, you're all alone, eh? What's your name? Jim Hawkins, sir. Hmm, tell me, Jim. Have you ever seen a seafaring man in this here grog shop? Name of Bones? Captain William Bones? Bones, sir? No matter, boy. Just hand me the glass. He drank, threw me a coin, and left the inn. When I was sure he was gone, I dashed up the stairs. And then he called for you, Captain, by, by the name, Sir, Sir Captain William Bones. What sort of man, Jim? Was it a one-legged man? No, but he, he had a terrible scar on his face. Black dog. When you see his black dog, boy, you can be sure the man with one leg ain't far off. Rum, Jim. Fetch me rum. But I can't, Sir. I, I promised Dr. Livesey. Come on, boy, I said rum. But you know what she told you. She said it would kill you. Run for the blood. <coughs> I've got to get me strength again. I dared not leave the inn, yet I couldn't stand there watching the old captain die before my eyes. I had to go for Dr. Livesey. I ran to the door, but as I flung it open, a man loomed up before me. Before I could move, his fingers like iron closed on my wrist. Now then, boy, take me to Captain Billy Bones or I'll break your arm. The man was blind. In his free hand, he carried a stick, lifted now as if ready to strike. I led him across the room, but Captain Bones scarcely raised his eyes. He just sat there, as if in a trance. This is C Captain Bones, sir. It's a friend you come a calling, Bill. It's Pew. Pew with the gift from the old shipmates. Blind Pew. He dropped a piece of paper on the table. Then he grinned, and with no further word, found his way alone out of the door. On the scrap of paper was a black spot, and two words. Until dark, it says, Jim. The black spot. Until dark. I don't know what you mean. They won't get it out of me. What's frightful mine is mine. Give me your hand, me. We'll do that one-legged man yet. <laughs> Help me, Jim. Back to my room. Shaking and gasping, he opened an old sea chest. Then with a knife, he slit the lining of the cover. From it, he took a map. He staggered back to the stairs, but he never reached them. Captain. I'm done, young Jim. I'm done. Bring help, boy. Yes, sir. Right away. Wait. Take the map. Keep the map. They'll come looking for it, but not a word, you hear? Yes, sir. Good boy. No mention of the map, and, and I'll go shares with you. I'll skip, matey. And fast. It was dark when I returned to the inn with Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey. The place had been ransacked. We found Captain Bones on the stairs. He was dead. Well, Livesey, what's your verdict? He wasn't killed, Squire. He died of shock 
of rum. I wonder now what those rascals wanted out of him. I think I can tell you now, sir. N- now that he's dead, it it was this, sir. Bless my soul. A map. Oh, it's my life. Look what it says, doctor. Flint's map. Flint? Flint the pirate. How'd you come by that? He gave it to us, sir. He, he said we'd share. Share what, Jim? Pirate treasure, Livesey. Flint's <laughs> soul. Come now, squire. Everyone knows of the ships that he's plundered. It seems our departed friend was the only one who knew where the treasure's been hid. So that's what the scoundrels wanted. A map of Flint's treasure island. Oh, you're a trump, Jim Hawkins. Mark my words, you will share. Listen to this, Jim. Spyglass Hill, it says. Uh, bearing south, southeast, to uh, finger trunk tree. And then Sioux Cable South. Go on, go on, man. Go on, go on. There to larboard to northeast to foot of white crag, ten paces east, and a chest of seven hundred thousand pounds. Bless my soul, bless my soul. Why, with favorable winds and a crew like this, we'll have Flint's gold within the year. <laughs> You'll speak for yourself, Squire. I have practice. I'm your practice. You think I'd go to sea without a ship's doctor? And you believe this map is authentic? Believe, do I? Then why were those ruffians here? And why is Captain Bones dead? Tell the truth, Livesey. Oh, you're as frightened as a rabbit. There's only one man I'm scared of. Name the dog. Go on, name him. You! You can't keep your trap shut. Blast you. I'll be as silent as the grave. And I'll off to Bristol in the morning. You know, Jim, I think he means it. I'll pick up a ship in Bristol and you and Jim can join me. You'll make a fine cabin boy, Jim. I'll see to that. Uh, his mother might have something to say about that. She'd listen to you, ma'am. She knew you were going. To be sure he's going. I'll wager my wag on it. Squire Trelawney kept his wig. I was still in a delirium of joy when I found myself many days later on the walls of Bristol. At my side was Dr. Livesey, and standing before us with all the brass of the Lord Admiral himself, Squire Trelawney. Well, we're here, Squire. The fools that we are. Look out on the bay. There she rides, gentlemen. A ship. You've got a ship! Three masts square rigged with the name Hispaniola. Hispaniola? Well, she'll bring back all the pirate gold that we can put aboard her. No talk of treasure here. Not, not in public. Oh, to be sure, to be sure. Mum's the word. Mum's the word. When can we board? Well, you'd better ask Captain Smollett. Five days she's been selecting a crew. Five days. Cautious, eh? Outrageous, huh? When I threatened to intervene, she told me to go hire a ship's cook. So, I bet you, I did. A chef from Paris, I presume. (laughs) None of your little jokes, Livesey. Fellow by the name of uh, Long John Silver. I didn't waste good time poring over his credentials either. All I needed was a taste of his ham and his buttered eggs. That's his own tavern there, over yonder. The spyglass inn. Follow us, Livesey, and see for yourself. It was then I had my first sight of Long John Silver. Great bulk of a man, brown and leathery from years at sea. But he did not move quickly, and when he came from the side room, I saw why. His right leg was gone. He walked on a peg with a crutch, and suddenly I heard the voice of Captain Bones again. What sort of man, Jim? Was it a one-legged man? But if my fears were immediate, they were as quickly dispelled by the cheery greeting in a friendly manner by Long John Silver. Top of the morning to you, gentlemen. Sit ye down, if you kindly will. For you, Squire, kidney pipe, piping hot. And this be for Dr. Livesey. You know my name. Squire's told me that much about the two of you. It comes naturally. Ah, and this be young Master Hawkins. Yes, sir. Hawkins. Proper seafaring name it is. You, uh, run your house quite well, my man. Haven't seen fruit in a tavern, ever. It's a rule of health, which same I learned sailing under the immortal stamp. God rest his soul. You hear that? Under Admiral Stanley. Aye, your honor. Quiver and bay. You favor the admiral yourself, squire, if I may say so. Why, you and him could make up your mind like that. Oh, do I now? I noticed it afore, too. Wouldn't surprise me none to hear you say, Heave up the anchors, lad, we sail on the hour. Uh, We can't sail without a crew, Mr. Silver. You'd think there wasn't an honorable sailor in all of Bristol. I beg to differ. If I may 
make so bold. Why, there's a full cargo of my old shipmates become right here in town. Sound men inside, Your Honor. And if some were scarred in the services of England, then them with no pin pensions either. Could they be had at short notice? Yes, sir, but they don't be pretty enough for the modern taste, sir. And just what does that mean? It means, sir, that the beauty of their youth is faded in the giving of themselves to their king and country. Appearances be hanged. Bring in a crew come dark, and I, for one, will be greatly obliged. Will do, sir. And if I may say, sir, I know every sailor in these parts like the palm of my hand. Excuse me, Mr. Silver? Yes, Master Hawkins. Did you ever know of Captain Billy Bones? Bones? Billy Bones. <clears throat> Which ship did, ship did he sail on, matey? He was a pirate, I I think. <laughs> Lord love ye, lad. Why, them had sailed with the Admiral had no speaking acquaintance with pirates. I look at the lad, squire, and doctor, sir. The spitting image of myself when I was his age. Oh, head full of pirates. But he'll learn soon that the sea be mostly hard work, and the biggest satisfaction a man gets is doing his duty. And begging your pardon, sirs, if I may suggest filling up why the victuals is still hot. There was no doubt about it. Long John Silver was the finest cook who ever sailed the seven seas. When the meal was over, the squire was all for taking us aboard the Hispaniola. But Mr. Silver had a different thought. I've been thinking, squire, could you spare me the services of Master Hawkins? Just for today, I mean... <laughs> What on earth do you need him for? I have more on my hands getting me in ship shape for the new owner. And uh, <clears throat> there's the crew you asked me to. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, stay here, Jim, and lend him a hand. But, sir. This way, Dr. Levesey. Uh, don't worry, Jim. We'll be back for you before night. Now then, lad, suppose you come with me into the galley. There we can talk free to each other. Peace in the bay. Peace in the bay. Why? Why, that's a parrot in there. An evil-minded bird she be. Play, you old bumbo, play. Ah, peace the bay, peace the bay. Uh, I said play. Dead men tell no tales. Swearing blue fire in front of a gentleman. Is she yours? Aye, lad. Captain Flint, I calls her. Named after the famous buccaneer. Twas the pirates that taught her how to swear. If you want to know more about pirates, Jim, ask Captain Flint only... I'll wager as you can't make her talk. Go on, lad. Try. Pirates, Captain Flint. Pirate. Peace of the day. Peace of the day. <laughs> you did it. You made her talk. Strike me down, smart as paint you are. Mrs. Silver, look. They're at that window. Aye, lad. That man there on the key. The, uh, be someone you know. Black dog. He's a pirate. I know he is. A pirate? <laughs> Don't move, lad. I will round all hands and round them down. Peace the bait, peace the bait. Hurry, please. Don't let him get away. There be a pirate, young lad says. Do your duty, men. The men left the tap room. Through the window, I saw them hail Black Dog. He turned quickly and ran, the others after him. But I could not help thinking that they were letting him escape. He got away, lad. Too quick he was. Pirate, eh? What was he doing here, I wonder? Ah. I don't know. Black dog, eh? He's the mate. He's the mate. Black dog. Ah, black dog him. That's, that's a pistol. Ah. Yes, your honor. And fully loaded. Here, feel the balance. Gee, it, it, it's a fine pistol, Mr. Silver. Mind the trigger guard. Solid silver. Specially made for their Admiral Stanley, who gave it to me. Rest him for his loyal and conspicuous service. Do you think you could shoot it? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I might have known smartest paint, just like I said. Put the pistol in your pocket, boy, and if you ever capture light on that there black dog, repel borders. Peace the yes, sir. Peace the bay. You know, lad. I know as a lad I can trust while doing my duty by the squire. You're leaving? Ah. And when I come back... I'll have a sidearm, and you as well a sidearm. You mean to keep? That's my meaning, matey. Now, be we shipmates? Shipmates. Ah. It's a bold shake of the hand, Master Hawkins. Clear sailing, matey. 
He could move amazingly fast, wooden leg and all. As I watched him striding down the street, I wondered if in all England there was a boy half so fortunate as I. Out in the harbor rode the good ship Hispaniola, our voyage buried treasure with Long John Silver. That afternoon, Dr. Livesey took me out to the ship, and then, at sundown, Long John Silver came aboard. He had kept his word and brought a crew. Like I said, Squire, they ain't pretty, but they do nose the sea. Line up, chum, so we can look you over. Captain asked the squire and Dr. Livesey to step into his cabin. I'll speak plain, gentlemen. I don't like this cruise and I don't like the men. Well, possibly, ma'am. You don't like your employer either. We need trustworthy crew. Not one crew to have the muck by a ship's cook. The ship's cook was acting under my orders. And is the cook responsible for the ship's safety? Um, I must say... Uh, Captain Smollett... We are all concerned for the ship's safety. Now, what do you propose? The whereabouts of any treasure map to to be kept strictly secret, even from myself and my mate, Mr. Arrow. The firearms removed from the forward hold and stored aft here. Surely you don't uh, anticipate mutiny? Well, if I did, I wouldn't put out to sea at all. Oh. Well, Trelawney? Anything, if it'll get us out to sea. Agreed. Men, you'll find, gentlemen, that I'll do my duty. I can vouch for Mr. Arrow, my mate, and the five men I had previously signed. And when can we sail? We should be ready by midnight. Very well. Come on, Livesey. Our captain is a very conscientious woman. Well, I find her conduct un-English. Downright un-English. That night, in the full of the moon, the Hispaniola bellied out to the wind. Our voyage had begun. I stood watching the lights of Bristol disappear, and then I was aware that someone had lowered a hand down on my shoulder. Look hard, Jim Hawkins. It'd be a many a day afore you see Bristol Harbor again. You'll see a many sights, matey. Things you will never forget so long as you be alive. We'd been at sea for almost a month without incident, until one afternoon Captain Smollett had reason to call all hands on deck. Mr. Arrow, the mate, had found a pistol on one of the sailors. Since this is a first offense, I shall let it go unpunished. But let it happen again, and the penalty will be 15 lashes. Crew dismissed, Mr. Arrow. If one man was guilty, I was no less so. But I had a friend to turn to, Long John Silver. So, so I'll have to turn to my pistol too, won't I? Right, belay. Make him off the plank. Make him off the plank. Here now, here. It did go hard with Long John if you were to turn it to now. But I'd do no harm with it. Peace the mate. Peace the mate. Well, he's the captain with a suspicious turn of mind, and here I am handing out firearms to able bodied sailors like yourself. Ah, peace the mate. Peace the mate. Do you keep it out of sight? Oh, yes, sir. Always. May him off the plank. May him off the plank. And you ain't given to no rum drinking neither, are you? Oh, no quarrelsome neither. So's my advice. Jim Hawkins is to keep the pistol and no harm to nobody. Whatever you say, sir, I'll do it. That's a good boy. Fifteen lashes, just because I want to defend myself. Fast, George Mary, it's time you learn just who is captain and who gives the orders. The captain wouldn't go around it sticking his nose in Foxel's business. You lay one finger on Mr. Arrow and you will answer to me, George, personal. Mr. O is a friend of Long John Silver's and I plan to take care of him myself. Be that clear with you, mates. I'll listen to you, John. Even before Mr. Arrow, I guess. Was you and me worth our salt, matey? Why, we'd think up a way to sweeten Mr. Arrow's disposition. Like, uh, something special for supper. Plum pudding, maybe, for a cold and stormy night? Stormy night? She's clouding up, Jim. It will rock proper come evening, but, uh, Plum duck ain't no better than bilge water without rum. Can't you use rum for cooking? And have the captain suspect me of sneaking double grog? Well, what if I ask Squire for some? Without the captain knowing? Oh, I'm sure I could. Blow me down, you're a good Jim. Just seen it from the start. Go get the rum, boy, and bring it here. We ran into weather that night, just as Long John said we would. The crew in the forecastle were slow to change watch. Mr. Arrow came below to rouse them out. Starboard watch on deck. Mr. Arrow, could you spare me a moment, sir? Well? If you would join me in the galley, sir Plumduck, 
It's made special for you, sir. And oblige, Mr. Silver. Have your fill, sir. And this here bottle is what gives it its flavor. Half full. It is so sweetened it's said to suit your taste, sir. The bottle of rum was empty when Mr. Arrow went up on deck. By morning, the storm was over. It was Squire Trelawney who told me the news. A tragedy, Jen. A tragedy. A great tragedy. Squire, what happened? Last night in the storm, Mr. Arrow apparently was washed overboard. The Hispaniola sailed on, and even I began to wonder if this long voyage would ever end. It was a sailor named Gray, one of the six recruited by Captain Smollett, who gave me hope. Ah, don't fret, boy. We'll set land soon enough. The signs have come. What signs, Mr. Gray? For one thing, the crew turned quarrelsome. The beer and water credits kept crowning. Sure send, boy. Land soon. There's still some apples left in the barrel. We'll sight land when there's the last one bit. And I'm going down below and eat them all. I went below to the apple barrel. It was a huge barrel, and being almost empty, I found I had to climb in to get at the last few. A moment later, I heard voices, the crew, and among them, Long John Silver. Peace to the bait. Peace to the bait. Make him walk the plank. Make him walk the plank. So you've something to tell us, Mary? Well then, play your fault. We can take the ship now. What are we waiting for? I sense you join me. The only ones on Captain's side is Grace and Joy and Hunter. And I say we cut their throats. And I say there'll be no killing in it until I gives the word. I'm going soft, John. When we was with Flint, you're all cut. You thick-headed swab. Who got rid of Mr. Arrow so quiet no one suspected? Not even Jim Hawkins who brought me the rum for this job. And just like that... Who will get you the firearms the same way when the time comes? All we want to know is what we're waiting for. Ah. We're waiting for the first rate sailor, Captain Smollett, to sail this bum boat to our destination. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? Such being that you wait till my signal. Eating folks will grow up while them in the cabins have meat and rum and wine. When thirst be upon you, George, Mary. Bite into an apple. I've the mind to chew on one myself. There'll be a barrel, John, but you got to reach for now. Drop a knife on one, Mr. Hans, and pluck it out. I heard his knife slip out of the sheath. I saw the blade poised over me, but it never descended. On deck, Mr. Gray had sighted land. Uh I climbed shaking from the barrel and ran to Captain Smollett's cabin. To him, the squire, and Dr. Livesey, I told what I had overheard. Long John Silver. I just can't believe it. I never questioned his loyalty. Captain Smollett, ma'am, I'm a fool. Uh, no more than I, Squire. Well, it appears this precious few of us now, and make it eight of us against twenty of them. But you forget Jim Hawkins, ma'am. Nine of us, then. We have all the firearms. Can't we surprise them? That's my plan. Once we get them all ashore. As I see it, they won't make their move until we found the treasure. Meanwhile, I was in no cause for alarm. Jim, you've brought us this warning. I wonder, can you do it a second time? Could you keep your ears open for us, lad? Stay friends with Silver. Stay friends with, with him, ma'am? Well, can you, boy? Yes, sir. I, I think so. Good lad. Now then, has any of you ever seen that island before? I have, sir. I was a cook once on Traitor's Waters here. Do you remember the anchorage, Mr. Silver? Yonder, sir. There in that inlet. You give me a strong pull and a long boat, and I'll guide this ship in there like a lamb. Good. Stand by, drop anchor, and load the boat. Any questions? Excuse me, ma'am. Can can I go along with Mr. Silver? Well, Mr. Silver? I'd be that happy to take them, ma'am. Jim Hawkins could give his hand at the tiller. Permission granted. You did well, Jim. Well, what did he mean about guiding the ship? The longboat will toast into anchorage. Silver will need most of the crew to man the oars. Those who remain aboard ship will be our prisoners. Yes, but what if they rush us first? That squire is the chance we'll have to take. Find Silver Jim, stay close to him, boy, and good luck. Yes, ma'am. An hour later, the longboat was in the water, pulling the Hispaniola closer and closer to the shore. Whenever I could, I looked behind, trying to catch a glimpse of what was going on on board. The man at the tiller, Master Hawkins, keeps his eyes on the shore. Yes, sir. Stand away, John. Lift your oars and drop your anchor. Here, Captain, this is your spot. I heard the splash of the anchor behind us, 
followed almost at once by shouts of warning by Captain Smollett. On your guard, men! They draw knives! What's she yelling about? Oh, that fool George Mary didn't wait for my signal. We're in for it now, boys! Point towards the shore. Turn about and come along. Surrender your men or I'll shoot. With Jim Hawkins at my side, you fire that musket and I'll cut his throat. Mary, can you hear me, you blundering squid? I, I hear you. Them shots just a warning. Then lie low to a truth be made, and this time, follow orders. Oh, you dare to hold that boy? Wait, and I'll have you... In your pardon, sirs, I ain't finished with what I got to say. I'll give you one hour to send a boat with Flint's map, and give yourself to Mr. Mary. So be it if you want to see Jim Hawkins alive. Do what he says, Jim. We'll save you. Don't take it so hard, matey. Why, you're lucky to come along with old John here. He'd have had nothing to bargain with. Let go of me. Why, I even puts me knife away. There, now, see? Come back here, you! After him, you swabs! I had jumped into the shallow water and struggled for shore. It was heavily wooded beyond the beach, but how long I could elude them, I didn't know. I could hear them crashing through the brush after me. But gradually, the sound of my pursuers grew distant. They'd gone inland, and later a wisp of far-off smoke revealed they were making camp. As I turned for the shore, something sprang at me from the bushes with the figure of a nightmare. I drew the pistol Silver had given me and... No, no, don't shoot, don't. I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am. You wouldn't harm poor Ben Gunn. Out of my terror, I saw a human being, scrawny, long-haired, his bones covered with pieces of tattered canvas. He was on his knees now, imploringly. It's just me, poor old Ben Gunn. I haven't spoken to a Christian these five years now. Five years? Were you shipwrecked? No, mate. Marooned. Tell me, that ship, might that be Flint's ship? No, Flint's dead. But I seen his men. I seen him come ashore. Some are Flint's men, but they got aboard by trick. Aye, but is there among them a man with one leg? One leg man. John Silver, and I hate him. Oh, he's come back. I'm as good as dead. It was him who marooned me. What be your attack now, young master? If you could help me low wrong boat, then... Oh, uh, then... boat, says you. Ben guns your man, says I. What might you call yourself, mate? Jim. Well, now, Jim, you just follow Ben Gun. Not the sign of anyone on the beach, squire. Not that I can see. I pray God the boy's still alive. What about the stockade at the end of the cove? It appears empty and without arms. I'm sure those cutthroats went in. Behind the stockade? We'd stand a chance of rescuing young Hawkins. Precisely. We'll leave two men aboard. There's no way our prisoners can reach the deck. Two men will suffice. We'll load the jolly boat with supplies and come back and forth to relieve the guards. Good. Then let's be at it. Stand by, Mr. Gray, to start the jolly boat. Ben Gunn had led me to a cluster of rocks. Carefully hidden among them was a tiny boat. Made it with my own hands, I did. Bamboo, Jim, and goat skins. But first, says I, we'll see if the coast be clear of Flint's men. It was then we saw the jolly boat heading for shore. They were coming for me. I'd be safe. Coming ashore, says you. But what might that be, says I. There, on the ship, look at Jim. Men crawling out the portholes, climbing up to the deck. It was all too true. The prisoners, trapped aboard the forecastle, were escaping through portholes. There were a few shots and silence. Then, from the main mast, I saw the skull and crossbones catching the breeze. Silver's men had taken over our ship. By now, our friends on the jolly boat had reached the shore and rushed for the safety of the stockade. Meanwhile, Silver had led the men on shore back to the beach, back to the longboat, out of range of the stockade. Unarmed, they were making their way to the ship. Now that they have the ship... They've got everything. Everything but the map. Map, says you. What map? Never mind. Come along, Ben. No. My friends will harm you. I promise. If your captain was to deceive Ben Gunn, tell her to come tonight, alone, to the top of Spyglass Hill. And tell her this. Them as hides can find. And them as finds can hide. In the stockade, I was welcomed as one returned from the dead. I told them at once of my meeting with Ben Gunn. And what's your opinion, lad? You think this creature's sane? I think he is, sir. And why would he want you to come after dark, Captain Smollett? Safety, of course. Hmm. 
And right now we may expect visitors ourselves. They're coming from the ship, Captain. Aye, uh, the longboat's full of them. Can you load a gun, Jim? I, I think so. Let them come by, Jove, and we'll be ready for them. It's silver, Captain, with a flag of truce. Take your positions, men. All suit at once. Open the gate, Mr. Gray. Stay undercover, lads, and wait for me. Aye, sir. Now close it, and shoot with the first false move. Flag of truce, Captain, sir. Flag of truce. And what does that mean, Mr. Silver? Captain Silver to come aboard, sir, and make terms. Captain Silver? Who's he? It's me, sir. Those poor lads yonder have chosen me to be their captain, sir, after your desertion of the ship. It's a pretty place you have here, for sure. And Jim, I was my old mate. I've nothing to say to you. And squire and doctor. Well, since the long and short of it is, I has the ship, I has the men, I has the armaments. Only what I don't got be Flint's map. So, here be me terms. You give me that there map and you can keep your lives. I'll divide the stores and I'll give you me Appy Davy to stop the first ship I see and send it here to pick you up. Your word, Mr. Silva? Handsomer you couldn't ask for. Then hear my terms. If you come here, one by one, unarmed, I'll clap you all in irons and take you home to stand fair trial. Well spoken, Captain Smollett. Now you listen to me, John Silver. You can't find the treasure, you can't sell the ship, and your cowardly scum can't fight. So get out of here, double quick. So be it, Captain and Squire, so be it. But before the hour's out, you'll be begging me for my help, and them what die will be the lucky ones. Long John Silver and his men attacked us immediately, but the stout logs of the stockade held and we drove them off, though not without cost. Joyce, one of the loyal sailors, lay dead. The greatest blow was the death of Dr. Livesey, who was found having succumbed to a series of stabs she had kept hidden from the rest of us as she attended to the wounded. Do you think they'll attack again tonight? I, I don't know, Jim. It's hard to foresee the end of all of this. Therefore, I want you to have the treasure map. It's yours by rights, you know. If that's your wish, Squire. And if the worst comes to the worst, don't hesitate to buy your life with it. But they won't drive us out of here in a hurry. Well, I don't know if they will, Squire. Eh, what's that? Why not? Well, with the high tides, they could bring the ships closer to the shore. And once they're within can range, they could level the fort. By Jove, they could. If John Silver thinks of it, blast him! And they have all the boats. Otherwise, I'd try to reach the ship and cut the anchor rope. But we can't stay here in the stockade. Jimmy spoke of Ben Gunn. Any meeting with him tonight? Perhaps he knows of where we can hide. I'm sure he does, ma'am. Then I'll go looking for him right now, within the hour. I too had a plan. Under cover of darkness, I slipped unnoticed from the stockade and reached the rocks where Ben Gunn kept his little boat. In my belt was a knife. I paddled silently out to the Hispaniola, climbed to the deck, and cut the anchor rope. So be you, Master Hawkins. Come to join us, evil swabs. It was... It was Israel Hans. I struggled with every ounce of strength and broke away. But as I did, the map of Treasure Island fell from my shirt. Lynn's map. So it was you who had it. I grabbed it from the deck and leapt for the rigging. I climbed higher and higher, but Hans was right behind me. When I could go no further, I drew the pistol from my pocket. Stay where you are, Mr. Hans. But you've got a pistol, Master Hawkins. Go down to the deck. Just like Silver said, smart paint. One more step, Mr. Hans, and... And I'll blow your brain! Jim, Jim, I reckon I'll have to strike a course, which comes hard to see for a master mariner to a ship uncle like you, Jim. Suddenly, he grabbed his knife and threw it. There was a great burst of pain as it pinned my shoulder to the mast, but I pulled the trigger and the body of Israel Hans hurtled into the sea. I clung to the ropes and pulled out the knife, but for moments after, I was unable to move. And then I saw that the tide was carrying the ship towards shore. Somehow, I climbed down and made my way to the beach. Squire, Captain, it, it's me, Jim. Open the gates, please. Captain, strike me. It's matey. It's Jim. I must have fainted. When my senses returned, I was in the stockade. My friends were gone, and in their places stood Long John Silver and his cutthroats. But I made no move to let them know I could hear them talking. He'd been bleeding bad. Someone picked him for certain. Save me from cutting his throat, the little swab. A vast, George Mary. Stand clear. A vast, is it? 
Maybe a touch of steel would show young Master Hawkins which side you're on, and a few others I can name as well. Maybe you be thinking you, the captain here, eh, George? Th- this here crew would lay a slight more confidence in a captain who allowed us our say in enemy prisoners. <laughs> Why, you knothead! With him bad hurt, they'll trade the map for his life. We'll hoist flag of truce and hail to the captain. Before this crew takes any more orders from you, we claim our right of counsel. Hey, according to rule! Have your counsel in the hand. Jim. Jim, can you hear me? Where's... Where's the captain? And, and the squire? They give us the slap, slip lad during the night. And lay still. You'll be careful for proper. Old John will fetch the captain here. And then, lacking a leg, as he climbed to the top of the stockade, Long John hung a flag of truce and shouted for Captain Smollett. Don't fret, boy. They'll see the flag. And, uh, speaking of seeing things, I, I just been seeing something myself. The Hispaniola, beached on the shore. That be your doing? That be the cause of your hurt? Yes. I, I cut the anchor off. <sighs> Tis a real wicked trick, Jim. And if it was I you, I'd keep my mouth shut about it. We've finished our council, Mr. Silver. This be for you. Piece of paper, is it? With a black spot on it. Oh, and the word deposed were written. Very beautiful, George. We're choosing a new captain. And do they vote me in? I'll see to it. There'll be no voting until that treasure map is disposed of. Until then, that black spot ain't worth a biscuit. Map or no map. And how be ye to find same without the map? John, Silver. Post Mollet, she's in that flag. <sighs> Link to it, all of ye. It's young Hawkins, he's been hurt. If Jim's there, bring him out of the stockade. I let ye out yonder. Do you give me your affidavit not to slip cable? Yes. Word of honor, then stand side while I parley and sharp look out on all sides. May I ask the young man trying to keep a foot in each camp? In him, only one leg. We met some 50 yards from the stockade. As gently as she could, the captain dressed my wound, calling on memories of her father, a barber who often cared for the injured around her childhood hamlet. Taking a nice thing, boys, eh, Silver? Not me, sir. If it wasn't for Long John, he'd have had a throat cut. He was aboard the Hispaniola, which same he's gone and beached it. He's what? Last night. Jim? Yes. Even so, when I find the lad half dead, I says to myself, Long John, you have got to save this dear boy. Oh, so now Captain Silver wants to join us again. Sir, I'll be honest and open with you, as I always am. I do. I think old dust of this dear boy stuck to him like pitch I did. You would have killed me yourself if you had the map, but, but you'll never get it. I'll die first. <sighs> but I has the map, Jim. Be it this or be it not. And what's good of treasure without a ship to haul it? And what good's a ship and to haul me to the hangman? Now, say I was to further preserve young Hawkins' life, do you think you could save mine? You can save Jim. I could guard him from them, their scum, but they won't stop until they see treasure dug. I want to speak to the boy alone. Speak and be welcome. I'll send off. Jim. Jim, I have no idea how you managed to save us that ship. But I lost the map. Well, your safety is much more important. Now all draw their fire, and, well, they're waiting to reload. You run to the woods. The woods, ma'am? Yes, with Ben Dunn. He knows about a dozen hiding places. No, but, but I can't. I gave Long John my word. They would have killed me. They would have killed me long before if it hadn't been for him. But you... Well, I guess it makes sense. All right, Silver. Aye, sir. Now you keep an eye on this boy. If we get out alive, I'll do my best to save you. Ah, couldn't say more, were you my mother? Oh, God forbid. Good luck, Jim. Back in the stockade, Long John told the men he had just got the map from Smollett. And now by thunder, I will resign. Elect anyone you please, I am done with you. The hunt was underway. They followed the map with unholy care, and in a frenzy they started to dig, clawing at the ground like animals. In a matter of minutes, they struck the chest, wild-eyed and gasping. They heaved it to the surface and broke it open. Empty. It's gone. The treasure's gone. Stand by for trouble, Jim. Look! 
Just one dirty guinea, that's all. There's just 700,000 pounds, Mr. Silver. Hardly worth dividing, is it? So you didn't make a bargain with Smollett. They've been here first. Look at his face, mates. You can see it on his face. Kill him! He sold us out! I've won against a lot of you, and I've got two pistols, which the first one who... Long John Silver had fired only once. The other shots came from the Squire, Mr. Gray, and Ben Gunn. Unprepared for this sudden attack, the pirates were now our prisoners. Ben Gunn, to think it was you that got me. <laughs> How do, Mr. Silver? Pretty well, I thank you. What happened to Flint's gold, sister? Ben Gunn's cave, says I. Cave? What cave? It's true enough, lad. That's where we've been these many hours. It's all there, boy. A treasure beyond dreams. Save one dirty guinea. So it was, just as the squire said, treasure beyond dreams. First came the task of taking our prisoners to the Hispaniola, then the matter of loading the treasure aboard, and then back to the shore for Long John Silver. I've been thinking, Captain Smollett, how you ever clear the vessel and get that ship out and see again. Well, high tide and a stretch of canvas and she'll float right off whenever we've of mind. Yes, and that brings us to your fate, Mr. Silver. I stand as ever ready to do me duty, and happy as to think I had a small hand in saving young Master Hawkins. And that clears you of the crime of mutiny? He, Squire. He, he did save my life. Then you're free to defend him in trial. He'll stand a fair trial in Bristol. And now, Captain, I'll take this scoundrel back to the ship and clap him in irons. You're not alone, Squire. Mr. Gray, you and Jim, take them in the long boat. Not a move out of you, Silver. None of your monkey shines, either. Uh, do you permit a word, sir, with me tea? Talk your fool head off for all I care. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly, sir. Jim, my lad, I be thinking of Captain Flint. She still be in the stockade, and, well, would you take the parrot boy? Uh, only remember, she can't abide in a cage. None of us like cages, Jim. I... I couldn't, Long John. Are you fond of the bird, matey? I'd like to keep her, but she'd only remind me of you. No, the matter. I would still love to leave a trinket with a lad I respect. Keep your hands in plain sight, Mr. Silver. My hands, sir? Oh, they're just patting the boy, sir. Well, even so. Look out! He's got my pistol! Put that down! Put the gun down! Put it down! I tend you, I will. And how was I come up with but this? Now, drop your oars. Confound you! I'll have you hanged on the ship! Into the water, Mr. Gray. You too, Squire. Well, at first I must tell you that I am borrowing this longboat. So, out! How am I to swim to shore? Just spread your blubber. You'll find is how you can float. As for you, Jim... I'll jump. You don't have to tell me what to do. Belay now. I can't row and steer both. So I'm asking you to set me a true course through the channel, and I'll put you on yon rock. And if I don't, it will be the last thing I ask of you, matey. I took the tiller. I sat in the silence as he rowed desperately. There was a narrow channel. Finally, I saw my chance. I yanked the tiller and drove the boat into a sandbar. You have us on this beach, and now get out and shove me off. I'll take no orders from you. Why, you put me on here, and now you'll shove me off. Or by the powers, I'll crack your neck. They're coming after me in the jolly boat. And they'll take you. And they'll hang you for your crimes. They'll take you to Bristol, and... And they... And they can't. They can't hang you, John. Oh, Jim. Jim, boy, Jim. That's it, lad. Shove the nose out. I might have known you'd never let him hang your old shipmate. I'll hoist a bit of sail out yonder. I'll make it safe enough. Goodbye, matey. Good luck to ye. He was well out in open water when the squire and Captain Smollett reached the sandbar. He got away, squire. Oh, well. The sharks may do for him yet. Blast him anyway. I'm as wet as a herring. Blast him indeed, squire. And yet, I can almost find in my heart the hope that he makes it. I know he will, ma'am. I know he will.
Viva Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Soap Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next time when the Lux Radio Theatre presents The War of the Worlds. This is your host, Riley Kiwi, stepping in for Melville Ruick, who was filling in for me, who was covering for Cecil B. DeMille, saying goodnight to you from Hollywood.